today's video, I'm going to be taking this 18 year old treadmill, which still works. The handle's busted, it does make a lot of noise, and I'm going to cannibalize it for all the parts. I'm going to take the motor at the bottom, which is permanent magnet, along with all the circuitry. I'm also going to take all the components or circuit boards out of the control panel here, and once I remove them, we're going to take a look at everything up close. I'm also going to keep this roller right here. Could come in handy for another project. All I have to do is take out these adjustment bolts and these end caps pop off. One on each side. Down here. All these screws are going to come off this panel to access the motor. Okay, this is the permanent magnet DC motor made in Logan, Utah. And it's a 12.1 amp, 6400 RPM. It says clockwise rotation and insulation class F. I'm going to save this for other projects. Now you can see it has this very heavy cast iron flywheel. The purpose of this flywheel is while the motor is running, you have that kinetic energy. And the flywheel, because it has so much mass, it smooths out any variations in the speed. So it gives you more of a stable speed while the treadmill is in operation. Over here, this ties into this pulley up top. Now if you look over here on the larger pulley, which is connected to the belt, you're going to see there's a little plastic tube. And right over here is a magnet. Inside this tube is a magnetic sensor, and it senses the revolutions of this pulley. So this part right here must be used in conjunction with the speed control circuit. It's used as a feedback to let the computer know exactly how fast the treadmill is going. So if you were having speed issues with the treadmill, the thing to do would be to check out the spacing between the tube and the magnet. And also you could take the two wires leading from this sensor, probe them using a digital meter like I'm about to show you on a continuity setting, then rotate the pulley. All right, now right over here is the connector heading over to that power board, the power supply board. Let me probe this, but move this out of the way first. All right, let's do that. Let's put one here. Okay, so there's nothing on the meter, no continuity. Let's put this right next to it. Let's try right there. Now the magnet is lined up with the tube. Let's see if the alarm comes on. There you go. All right, so you confirmed that that magnetic sensor is working. I'm going to end up keeping that because it's going to be great for spare parts. And right here is a better view of the magnetic sensor, and you can see the magnet. This is the 120 volt supply coming in, goes into this 15 amp circuit breaker. This will be salvaged. This board right over here is the speed controller board for the permanent magnet motor. DC pulses drive this motor. It's pulse width modulation. This part right here is used to limit the inrush current into the permanent magnet motor. It's connected in series with one of the wires powering the motor. Once everything's removed, we'll take a closer look at the board, what components were used. Okay, everything is stripped out of this area. The wire harness goes up to the top. Okay, let's take a closer look at the permanent magnet motor over here, May of 98. So it's close to 19 years old. And the bearing is still excellent on it. Very, very smooth. The two blue wires right over here go to a thermal cutoff. It's wired in series with the power to this motor. And it's very easy to test them. Just measure between the two and you should hear the tone. If you don't hear it when it's cold, then you have a faulty thermal cutoff. Now the resistance measured across the positive and negative. Let's take a look at that. Okay, it's on auto range. Let's take a reading between the black and the red.
and 11.1 ohms. You can also take the positive and negative, connect it up to a cordless drills battery. The motor should spin. Or you could take a test light like you see right here. Play like that. And give this a spin. And it should act like a generator. And you should see that start to glow. So you know that motor is working pretty good. And look how long it continues to spin as a result of that flywheel. These motors do have brushes. Over time, they will wear down. Let me pop one out and take a look to see what this looks like after almost 19 years of use. Wow, major, major brush left. Look at that. It's like three quarters of an inch. No problem with that. Slide it back in. Nope. Let's take a closer look at the small transformer. Okay, this is it. It looks like it's around 14 or 15 gauge wire, copper. And when you measure the resistance across these two terminals, it's going to give you a very low reading of between 0.1 and 0.3 ohms in order to limit the inrush current into the motor. Right over here is the magnetic sensor, coming very handy for other projects. And here we have some bolts and screws that I salvaged from the machine. There's the belt. Over here is the circuit breaker, 15 amp, cord restraint. Over here is an internal, external tooth washer. Now this bolt over here doesn't have any markings on the head, so it's more than likely a grade 2, which is a lower grade, easier to break. It's not as brittle as a grade 5 or grade 8. Now the bolts that were holding the rollers down, it's a harder bolt. And you can see right here, there's three lines in the shape of a Y, and that's a grade 5 bolt. It's more brittle than that bolt, and it's stronger. And on engines, especially on the heads of engines, you're going to find fine thread bolts that have six lines on the head. And that would indicate a grade 8 bolt, harder to break, but it is more brittle than the grade 5. Here is one of the rollers. This is the adjusting roller, perfectly smooth, very good bearing. I'm sure I'll find use for that. And I'm also going to be keeping the other one because the bearing is perfect on that one as well. And the belt fits on this pulley nicely. So if I wanted to connect this to the flywheel of the permanent magnet motor for another project, I can do so. Now the speed control board, there's really not much to go wrong with it unless you had your treadmill plugged in during a lightning storm, then it's possible the integrated circuits could be damaged. But the main thing that fails are these SCRs, silicon control rectifiers, three along the side. I think these are S4020Ls, and then there's two more on this side. They're very easy to test. If you don't have a tester, I have a video showing how you can test SCRs. It's excellent. You can refer to that video by clicking on the circle with the I. You'll see it in the drop-down menu. I also show on my channel a very nice inexpensive component tester. It's around $30 and it tests everything, including the ESR of electrolytic capacitors. At the end of this video, you'll see that video shown. And besides the SCRs, the only other things besides the integrated circuits that would fail, like I said earlier, in the event of a lightning storm, would be these transistors and you could also check out the diodes. Now this is the back side of the control panel. Over here is where you do your heart rate monitor with your thumb. Goes over to this portion, this part of the circuit. And over here is where the LCD screen is. Let me show you that. That's for the heart rate. The pulse. 
and over here is the other LCD display for the speed. You can see where this black epoxy is. That's that one. Power goes from the bottom of the treadmill all the way up to here into this micro switch. You could hear it clicking right here. You could do a continuity reading between the terminals to make sure the switch is working. I have seen treadmills fail because this micro switch broke. So the power comes up, loops back, goes all the way down to that speed control board. Really not much to go wrong over here unless the display goes bad. Then you'd have to change this board out. And over here is a 10K slide potentiometer. And that's easy to check. You could do a resistance reading between the black and the red. It should give you the full rating of the slide potentiometer. In this case, between those two should be 10. If I put it a quarter of the way, maybe to there, between the white and the black should give you around 2,500. And between the white and the red should be around 7,500. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please rate it a thumbs up, subscribe, and post links to this video on other websites and blogs. Also be sure to check out my video playlist as well. Thank you very much for watching.